3rd, July. This meeting is being recorded. Our, our July meeting, uh, a presentation by PAE on their net zero building in downtown Portland. Uh, those uh, A lot of the people that attended expressed an interest in giving a tour of the building. And even those of you who uh, weren't able to attend but are interested in getting a tour, uh, they're going to make themselves available on the 18th of this month at two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we need to limit our numbers to 15, so it'll be a first come, first serve thing. Let Mike know, Mike uh, Unger know if you're able to attend, and we'll let you know if uh, you fall under that 15 person ceiling. One of the concerns that I think we all have is whether the transmission grid is adequate to support the green energy that's going to be developed in the form of wind and solar. And it's oftentimes uh, occurs far from uh, existing load centers. And how we get that energy from the generating site to the load center is uh, of concern to all of us. And we know that transmission lines are extremely difficult to build, very time consuming, uh, taking in in recent years here, 15 years or more to, to actually get constructed from the time that uh, they're, they're thought about, first thought about. And uh, we have Bonneville Power with us this morning and they have we have two presenters from Bonneville that are going to be addressing the issue of grid adequacy, both now and in the future. And uh, one speaker is Andrus Johnson, and our uh, second speaker is Dmitry Kostarov, and they both have extensive transmission planning and analysis uh, experience. And it, it was their bios were outlined in the meeting announcement that you all received, and I'm sure you read it, so I won't repeat that. But we're anxious to hear from Dmitry and Andrus, and uh, so I'll ask them to take it away and enlighten us. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll start with the first uh, few slides, and then Andrew's gonna uh, take over. <clears throat> so, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. You know. So um, let me find a way to move stuff forward. Um, uh, so the first slide just gives the overview of the Bonneville Power Administration. Again, we're a federal power market agency in the Pacific Northwest. We market power from uh, 31 federal dams and the Columbia Generating Station nuclear plant. Uh, dams are operated either by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and BPA Power is just a marketing arm. Uh, BPA also uh, owns and operates a pretty extensive transmission network in the Pacific Northwest, uh, more than 15,000 miles, and a third of that is uh, 500 kilovolt uh, lines you know, that span from Montana to um, uh, Seattle and, and Portland, and also from the uh, uh, Canadian border to border with California. So we are operator of several large uh, transmission paths in the West interconnection, the uh, in, into tie with Canada, uh, into tie with uh, Montana, and also the uh, two interties going to California, the AC intertie and HVDC intertie that terminates in, in Los Angeles. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, the transmission planning challenges. And um, if, if I'm to summarize them, it, it seems like we're going from the uh, incremental approaches where we uh, are doing some work you know, to ensure reliability, um, to accommodate you know, the load growth and some of the uh, in, in generation to connection to a really transformational uh, planning process where we need to address uh, decarbonization needs of the region, which results in significant uh, transformation in the in the generation supply, but also in the in the load uh, as well. Uh, so uh, many of you are familiar with the uh, decarbonization policies set, set by states of Oregon and Washington. In the state of Washington, there's a Clean Energy Transformation Act, uh, which uh, requires the load survey entities in the state to um, get rid of coal generation in their portfolio by 2026, which is pretty close. Um, and uh, by 2030, by end of this decade, become uh, greenhouse neutral and 
be limited to only 20% of electricity from the natural gas resources. And by 2045, be completely uh, renewable or non emitting uh, generation. So uh, in the Oregon, there's a, a similar bill you know, called a Clean Power Bill uh, uh, put in, in place last year. And uh, by end of the decade, uh, requires uh, the load serving entities in the state of Oregon get 80% emission reduction relative to 2010 baseline. Um, and then it gets progressive um, as, as we move forward with achieving complete decarbonization by uh, end of the next decade. Uh, so this uh, this uh, policies they uh, they result in the a significant change in the generation fleet. We'll we'll talk about this uh, uh, or several slides. Uh, but this is projections done by the um, uh, PNUC, which is the original organization um, of the um, resource addition that will be needed uh, in the next uh, ten years to enable the, the path towards decarbonization and meeting the, the first uh, milestone by end of the decade. Uh, so we um, expect you know, over 10 gigawatt of new resources to be added in the next 10 years. And that's in addition to the seven gigawatt of the wind and solar generation that's uh, connected to the system today reliably. If you can see the a big portion of this will be wind, uh, but also a rapidly growing portion will be solar generation and particularly solar generation uh, with, with uh, uh, storage, uh, typically battery storage collocated with the solar plants. We we'll certainly see many, many requests uh, um, of that nature. Uh, so at the same time, you know, as we experience in the significant changes on the uh, supply side, um, also on the demand side, we see uh, pretty significant changes. Uh, certainly um, uh, the in, in recent years, we've seen an increase in the large industrial loads, uh, primarily data centers, but also uh, semiconductor plants in the region. Um, and that's, uh, that's expected to continue on a, on a pretty unprecedented uh, scale. Uh, we also have uh, uh, electrification policies uh, set in place to uh, electrify the transportation sector, certainly in the large uh, cities like Portland and Seattle, starting with the uh, public transportation delivery uh, trucks, you know, and then uh, uh, ultimately uh, transition into the uh, uh, personal vehicles, uh, as well as the building uh, electrification con conversion from the uh, natural gas appliances to uh, heat pumps, uh, primarily which, uh, which are electrically connected. Uh, we also see increased number of climate events. Uh, certainly, many of us uh, still remember the uh, July, uh, I mean June 21 heat dome event. You know when we experienced um, uh, triple-digit uh, temperatures, uh, sustained triple-digit temperatures across the nor northwest, and reaching 115 degrees here in Portland. Um, so um, now, kind of going in the in the in the specific um, topics, you know, the the first challenge we see is is a, a shift in the resource locations. Um, and if if we see, uh, if we take a look, you know, the uh, the northwest peak low today is about uh, uh, 30 gigawatt in winter, and maybe summer, uh, slightly less, about 27 gigawatt. And, and today we have um, about 8 gigawatt of um, uh, thermal generators, primarily natural gas which is um, used to meet that, uh, that peak load demand. And um, uh, five gigawatt located on the west side, uh, close to the uh, city centers of uh, Portland and Seattle. Uh, so primarily in the, along the I-5 corridor uh, between the two cities. Um, and uh, as we um, uh, progress towards achieving the decarbonization goals outlined by the states of Washington and Oregon, uh, these natural gas plants will uh, run less and eventually they will be displaced completely with their uh, renewable resources. And uh, today we uh, most of its renewable resources located on the east side of the Cascade Mountains. Um, and um, uh, many requests are for solar generation in central Oregon and, and maybe the uh, northern Oregon as well. And there's a, a request for many wind plants in the in the Washington, as well as uh, Lower Snake area, as well as uh, up in um, uh, Montana. 
and Wyoming being, uh, being resources that are pursued by the load serving entities in, in the Northwest. Uh, so BPA currently looking at the ways to accommodate the, the change in the uh, resource location and, and see what, what type of additions we need to make to the system to ensure the delivery of these resources from the east side to the west side where we have our uh, most significant load centers of uh, Portland and Seattle. Uh, so the, um, we have um, uh, two corridors, one is a, a, actually four corridors, but but uh, two major ones you know, going from uh, 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 from Upper Columbia area, like uh, like Spokane to, uh, to Seattle, and then going from the uh, Lower Columbia area, like around the Dallas to, to Portland. And uh, we have currently uh, plans in pro progress, you know, to reinforce capacity on those corridors, primarily by optimizing the, the existing right of ways. So we minimize the in environmental uh, footprint of these projects, trying to make uh, the most out of the existing towers and wires um, to deliver the power to the load centers. Uh, also, there's interest in developing the offshore wind. Um, so BPA has been actively engaged with the Bureau of Energy Management, which is a leading agency for this development, as well as Oregon uh, Department of Energy, which recently completed a publication on the offshore wind integration. Uh, so with this, I'm going to cover a few slides on the offshore wind because of the um, it's a very uh, interesting topic. Uh, so the uh, existing Biden administration uh, announced a goal to develop offshore wind in the U.S. Uh, uh, territorial waters. And the goal is about 30 gigawatt of shore capacity by 2030 and the longer term objective of 110 gigawatt by 2050. And just very recently, um, uh, the administration um, increased its goal for the offshore floating wind, which is targeting primarily uh, the, the Pacific coast. Uh, because of the depth of the waters, the uh, the bottom fixed uh, turbines are not practical on the Pacific coast, so you need to have offshore floating uh, wind. And the goal of the administration to develop up to 15 gigawatt of the offshore uh, by 2035. So the references in this uh, presentation that can take you to the specific links. Uh, so the uh, southern Oregon coast uh, is often called the Saudi Arabia of wind. It's probably one of the best uh, regimes in the in the world, you know, starting from um, uh, maybe Cape Blanca going down to um, down to the um, Northern California. You have the strongest and very consistent winds. You know, this is one of the data sets uh, put together by uh, researchers at PNNL measuring wind speeds, and you can see there's a strength and consistency of the wind is is really unprecedented. Uh, the Atlantic uh, uh, wind uh, pales in comparison with the, with the resources we have here. So the currently um, uh, Bureau of um, Energy, uh, Ocean Energy Management Boehm, pursuing uh, wind development in two areas, one called Coos Bay um, and the other called Brookings. Um, this uh, uh, two areas located about 14 miles, 14 to 14 miles from the, uh, from the coast. Um, and uh, currently they're going through the leasing process. Uh, they publish these two areas. They, they respond into the comments provided by the um, uh, interested parties, primarily fisheries. Um, and also uh, the, the next step will be actually leasing the spaces for the, for the future development. Uh, from the time we lease to actually something gets developed, it, it, it takes um, anywhere from eight to, you know, to 10 years. So it's kind of a long-term long -term process. Uh, at the same time, the, um, in the state of Oregon, the Oregon Department of Energy recently published a report highlighting the, the challenges and uh, opportunities uh, integrating three gigawatt of floating offshore wind by the end of the decade. Um, this is a really, uh, really good, uh, good report. It's very informative and uh, uh, strongly, uh, strongly recommend uh, everybody to spend some time, at least most of the stuff I found on the offshore wind uh, came from that uh, that that report. Um, so so again the um, um, the towers located pretty pretty far in the ocean. I said maybe 14 miles from the ocean shore. You have uh, floating turbines. Uh, the the technology is kind of not very mature at this time. Um, uh, again, the there are some prototypes available in in Europe, but um, uh, to scale it to the 
uh, full capability, which I think they're looking about 15 megawatt for each turbine. Um, I think it's still in, in the development also, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good progress in that area. So you have a bunch of turbines connected um, uh, to the ocean floor with the uh, mooring lines. And then you have uh, uh, the, uh, the C or AC cables running between the turbines and going to the collector substation. And from the collector substation, it goes to the onshore to the uh, uh, existing the AC, AC or DC network. Um, so the um, uh, capabilities of the system, unfortunately, not not that great. Um, if you're looking at the Southern Oregon, um, it, the system was first of all designed for the local load service and uh, it, its ability to integrate gigawatt scale offshore wind um, uh, is it doesn't exist at this time. Uh, so we've done some uh, some studies internally at BPA to see what what is feasible and concluded that about um, a gigawatt of offshore wind, which is pretty decent amount, um, can be integrated in the uh, in the Coos Bay area at, at, at two substation, one Wenson substation close to uh, Florence and the other substation called Fairview close to Coos Bay area. But the best wind uh, in the in the Brookings area between the Gold Beach and Brookings, and uh, the, there's simply not enough transmission in that area. So if you want to access, you know, this uh, uh, premier resource of, of the wind, um, we'll have to build uh, some high voltage lines, per, most likely 500 kV lines to bring it back, you know, to the IFF corridor and then deliver to the uh, load centers in uh, in Portland or uh, potentially export, you know, to California, depending on where the demand um, is at the time. So the goal the Department of Oregon Department of Energy has is a, a three gigawatt development. Currently, studies underway jointly between um, uh, utilities in the in the Pacific Northwest to identify transmission solutions to bring a uh, three gigawatt offshore wind in the Southern Oregon. So the second uh, challenge that we have we have is what we call clean firm resources, and I want to use that term instead of dispatchable resources. Um, as it uh, more encompassing. So I think if you're looking at the um, load profiles uh, today on the system, you look at summer and winter profiles. The summer profile has a single peak, a pretty well-defined peak, and it, it really correlates quite well with the solar generation. So you can use uh, uh, oversupply of solar generation during the day to charge your storage and you can significantly flatten your, your load demand and use uh, renewable energy to, uh, to serve a load. Winter is somewhat more challenging. First of all, we have two peaks, morning peak and uh, evening peak. And in general, the winter loads are much more elevated because of heating. Um, and also the, uh, the, the valley between the peaks is also fairly elevated. So the opportunities to use uh, solar generation to, to uh, store you know, during the days is kind of limited. Also, the peaks occur during the uh, uh, times you know, when it's dark outside, obviously, and um, and that uh, that complicates you know the the, the uh, load serving problem. And, and also, as we proceed with the electrification process, and we convert more and more resources from natural gas um, uh, to ele electricity or water heaters, uh, space heaters, you know, we expect to see. Uh, these uh, winter peaks to grow faster than summer peaks. Actually, uh, last week, you know, we had a 20-year transmission planning discussion held by WEC, and California, I saw, was saying that they project their winter peaks uh, to increase significantly and potentially even uh, uh, challenge, you know, summer peaks under some conditions. So um, finding the firm resources uh, to serve this uh, winter peak lows could be a challenge, right? So uh, today, if you're looking at the call snap we had in five years ago and looking at the total system, about 29 gigawatt system. Uh, so about, um, I'd say, two thirds was served by hydro and uh, hydro will, will remain here. Um, and but quarter of, of load was served by the natural gas and the rest came from the imports. Uh, if we if we to move forward you know, to the 2040 when the major decarbonization objectives will be 
uh, will be met. Um, and we're looking at the uh, about 35 gigawatt system, assuming the uh, pretty conservative, I think, assumption in my mind, you know, that the system will, will grow on it to 35 gigawatts. Uh, in that case, maybe hydro will represent half of the generation. Well, what was the, the second half of the dispatchable or clean firm resources would be? So that's a question we're trying to uh, understand better. Um, and um, um, unfortunately, uh, some of the um, things um, uh, in the northwest, northwest don't work really well. If you look at the correlation between the load and the, uh, and the northwest wind, uh, typically at the days, you know, when we have peak loads and cold temperatures in the, in the northwest, and the wind generation is very, very small. I mean, this is BPA wind scaled, you know, to the full capacity of the BPA wind. And, and we've done actually a lot of analysis showing that wind capacity factor declines rapidly during the extreme hot or cold uh, temperature conditions. So that's not, not that's probably not the best resource to count, you know, to solve your peak loads. Uh, solar generation is doing uh, better. It's still the capacity factor is lower uh, than uh, than you see in summer, but um, it it could be available at least during the midday uh, to help offset um, uh, some of the energy needs um, or potentially uh, store that that power, you know, for capacity needs later in the day. Um, so potentially we need more storage in the region. Um, uh, that, that that's probably one big part of the solution: S storage either located in the load centers or co-located with uh, with solar plants. Uh, so the other option is to uh, to build uh, more transmission. Um, and I think uh, uh, and maybe before we do that, the, maybe the first thing is um, uh, to pursue the more aggressive energy efficiency, uh, demand response and energy storage. You mentioned the um, net zero building. So that, that, that certainly something will be uh, very welcomed by the, uh, by the power engineering community uh, to reduce demand and at least to offset some of the uh, increases in the demand that we project you know, from the uh, electrification, whether it's trans transportation or, or building electrification in the region. Uh, so that's um, that may be the first step. The second step is is to try to tap you know the offshore wind. Uh, some of the studies uh, done by PNNL show that actually the offshore wind is much more consistent. It's stronger. And during the recent um, heat wave we had in uh, uh, in July, uh, the the offshore wind was actually generating when onshore wind in the Oregon and Washington was uh, close to zero. So that's certainly a, a potentially good uh, good resource to uh, serve the peak loads in the in the area, uh, and also looking at the interregional transmission and um, trying to get uh, access to some diverse resources. Again, a lot of interest uh, in development of uh, Montana wind. I think Anders will talk about that. Um, maybe the discussions may be reaching even beyond Montana to the Dakotas, um, and there's a pretty strong interest in uh, bringing the Wyoming wind to, to the Northwest as well. And potentially some of the solar generation from the Southern states uh, when uh, in, uh, in winter, they may have some excess generation and, and being able to uh, bring it to the Northwest to serve winter peak loads. Uh, and also looking at the variety of uh, new immersion technologies um, and um, uh, very supportive of the, of the research in that area, like, uh, um, certainly uh, working with uh, some national labs on the long duration energy storage and working it with a department of energy on the energy hub concepts. You basically have uh, multiple uh, energy hubs like uh, like Amazon delivery centers in the, uh, in the Northwest where we can store the energy and then deliver to loads when demand is there. Um, again, the statement that you know, we, we need a diverse mix of um, uh, locations and, and fuels and uh, to meet the demand all hours of the year, uh, that, that's certainly uh, very critical. And also recognition that hydropower covers only a fraction, maybe, maybe 50 to 60% of the region's uh, capacity needs. And that needs to be complemented with tens of gigawatts of clean firm resources. Um, either located in the Northwest or uh, 
wider footprint you know, to achieve the decarbonization goals. Uh, the, the third challenge that we have is, is the resiliency. And um, it's um, uh, pretty evident as, as more and more sectors have become uh, dependent on the availability of reliable power. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, we can deliver uh, that power uh, during the extreme uh, climate events. Um, and um, um, there's an increasing, um, increasing um, interest in the um, in the industry to actually plan beyond, you know, the minimum reliability standards and to extend the planning to the to this extreme event. This is a picture of the uh, fires, you know, that we experienced in 2020 in the in the northwest. And uh, some of those fires, you know, cut transmission corridors, you know, that go to Salem area, um, and one of the corridors, you know, that goes in the North Seattle area. Um, and um, so, it, it, in this case, we're just one uh, contingency away from potentially interrupting load service, um, and uh, so that that was kind of a very very difficult um, operating scenario. Uh, when you lose uh, multiple major transmission lines because of the um, extensive fires. Uh, so we need to plan for resiliency, we need to plan for storage, we need to plan for, for things you know, that help us you know, to, uh, to withstand you know, this, uh, this climate events you know, with, the, with the minimum impact you know, to, um, to people. Um, with this, I think uh, we're going to transition to Andrews. We're going to cover the the remaining of the presentation. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. Um, one of the the challenges is that for for new transmission lines that we're going to need in the the 2030s or even around 2040, we we basically have to be thinking about it now because of how long it takes to go through the uh, permitting process and then the construction process. And uh, here's an example of, from the, the Boardman Hemingway project. Uh, this is a new 500 kilovolt overhead line uh, that would be about 290 miles from Boardman, Oregon to Southwest Idaho. Um, it would allow for bi-directional exchange of energy and then in combination with some other projects might al allow us better access to to the wind from, from further east, like Wyoming, and also give an outlet for um, at other times of the year when we have uh, an oversupply of clean energy to allow that to, to displace coal in the Intermountain West. So basically the permitting on this work started around the time my first son was born. Uh, he just started high school. It's still in permitting. Uh, and it probably won't be constructed until around the time he goes off to college or later. Um, huh. it's, and, and this is a, a line that mostly goes through uh, rural areas in, in Oregon and, and southern Idaho. And it's, it, I use this as an example, but, but other new lines, especially new greenfield projects in the West have, have run into similar issues to, to go just the, the amount of, of time it takes to get through the all the state and federal permitting requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for for this section, I was going to talk about uh, how we identify uh, least regrets expansions, and and that involves using scenario analysis and uh, expanding the planning horizon, which uh, Traditionally, was um, more in the five to ten year range. As a, the industry, we're starting to look further out now to a to a twenty year planning horizon. Um, this is an e example from a study BPA is working on right now in my group, where we're looking at uh, uncertainty around the end use demand. Uh, some of the factors to me we talked about, like the the electrification and the the, the high tech loads, there's there's quite a bit of uncertainty at exactly what what pace and quantity they might show up. So we want to test some proposed expansions and upgrades to our system under a variety of different futures to to make sure we're 
for coming up with a robust portfolio. Next slide, please. So there's there's several different analytical tools that we use for uh, planning the future grid needs, and, and basically you can think of them as as different. Uh, some of them zoom in more, and some of them zoom out. So the the image on the right there is uh, a snapshot from one of our zoomed out tools, which is a long-term capacity expansion model that we we use to for co-optimizing uh, resource and transmission additions from a regional perspective and in in this model we we represent the the power system with a few dozen zones and then we have idealized links between the zones and and we we run a full 20-year horizon but with less granularity and then the, the next step down in terms of granularity is our, our production cost model. And, and with that, we simulate a, a security constrained economic dispatch with unit commitment for a single year, hour by hour. So 8,760 hours in a row. And then zooming in even further is the, the power flow model, which is a full alternating current network simulation of an hourly snapshot, so a steady state snapshot for a like a winter peak or a summer peak hour, and then this model allows us to to really zoom in and and test the effect of outages and make sure that the system would be reliable. Uh, next slide. Um, here's an example of. Uh, how we look at how the transmission utilization may be expected to change over time in, in different scenarios and under different futures. So the, the plot on the left, the this is for one particular transmission path between the, uh, the Seattle and the Portland areas. And the, the base case is the, the light blue chart on, or the light blue trace on the bottom there and then this shows that for the the scenario cases the the utilization of that path would be expected to go up and then the, the amount of time during a, a year where there's congestion would would go up as well so that's like when there's a traffic jam on the transmission system so so going from the 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 light blue trace to the dark blue trace that was the impact of of one of the updated load forecasts in this scenario, and and that shows a, a modest increase, but but really it's the the changes in the resource mix. It's replacing the output of those thermal resources between Seattle and Portland most of the year with the non-emitting resources that are mostly coming from the east. That results in uh, uh, if you look at the guess kind of an orangish brown trace much higher utilization throughout the year and in over 2000 hours where the path is congested. So the what the model is saying is that we can't push any more power through that path. So we have to dispatch the system in a way that's not economically optimized in order to stay within the, the reliability limit of the transmission system. And then the number three there, the the, the red trace and the purple trace those are scenarios where we've we've simulated a targeted upgrade to this transmission path by um, i think replacing a, a a conductor with a higher rated conductor and increasing the, the limit by several hundred megawatts and 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 that's showing how that would significantly mitigate but not quite completely eliminate the congestion for this scenario and this I just picked this one path as a illustrative example, but but we can look at paths throughout our system and then also our our interconnections with our neighbors to see how the utilization may change 
in, in different expected future conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for for regional coordination, in in some parts of the country, there is a an independent system operator or an ISO that is sort of a, a one stop shop for uh, many of the different transmission planning and operation and market functions. In in the Pacific Northwest, it, it's a little different. We have several different entities that, that perform different functions, and, and we still currently have a, a bilateral market structure. Uh, for the, the entire Western interconnection, WEC is the entity that is responsible for the bulk electric system reliability. And then the, there's also a lot of uh, coordination among utilities and other stakeholders that that is uh, managed by WEC, where we uh, we build the the simulation cases needed for the the reliability and economic analysis, as well as other functions related to planning and operations uh, coordination. Um, the the Western Power Pool is a an entity that uh, BPA is a member of that. Uh, strives to help member organizations achieve maximum benefits of coordinated operations. So this includes uh, functions like reserve sharing in the operating horizon, so that by uh, by by pooling our, our generating capacity, so that we're prepared for a, a, an unexpected forced outage of a generator, by by spreading that risk across multiple footprints it allows for for more efficient operation of the system and then uh, western power pool also uh, is involved with uh, transmission planning support as well um, northern grid is the regional planning organization that, that covers the uh, pacific northwest and much of the intermountain west footprint that uh, bpa is a member of and, and that's where the utilities work together to, to optimize our, our plans. And then the, the Western Resource Adequacy Program, that's a uh, new function that's being developed. That's, that's making sure that there's enough generation available to reliably serve loads and um, making sure that everyone is is doing their fair share and, uh, and, and not unduly leaning on, on others. So that, that's going to uh, establish a region-wide resource adequacy program that, that's being implemented now. Uh, next slide. Um, Dimitri, did you want to do this one? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> if I can, I can do it. So, um... Uh, planning is a process, and as Andrew was described, you know, we have a wide variety of tools, you know, that we use to scan uh, various time horizons and with a, a various degree of precision. And um, uh, planning is something we, we do on continually on the regular basis as we get better information, better coordination with other regions. Uh, you certainly need to recognize, you know, that we, we live in the, in the greatest level of uncertainty, you know, the, and uh, uh, and there's a need to identify, you know, the, the portfolio of, of least regress, you know, what we call that, that help us to meet the uh, decarbonization goals in a, in a majority of the future scenarios that enters outline um, uh, scenarios um, with respect to load uh, projections as, uh, as well as, the, you know, the, the resource uh, locations. Um, and ultimately, we believe that uh, some type of diverse portfolio of resources uh, uh, both regional resources as well as interregional transmission will be needed to meet decarbonization goals, and it's 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 truly, I think, very challenging and, and exciting uh, time to be a planner in our in our industry. Of all of this, um, uh, thank you for for listening, and um, you know, if there are any questions, I mean, we could uh, we could try to answer them with Andrews. We we have several chat chat uh, uh, 
postings, if you could look at that. Let me let me take a look. I mean, I don't. Um, uh, There's also a couple of people with their hands raised as well. Pat and Mark had questions after we do the questions in the chat, maybe. Okay. Oh, actually, Mark, if you want to unmute yourself, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, Mark Gamba? Sure, thanks. <clears throat> I actually have three, unfortunately. One's kind of a follow-up to another. Um, okay. On, on permitting for these major, uh, the major expansions of, of the power grid and it taking so long, why does it take so long? What, what specific thing causes it to take so long? Um, I I can answer that just with the 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 B2H project. Some of the the issues that we had to address in the in the, the state and federal permitting was uh, the the habitat for for threatened or endangered species, uh, Native American cultural resources. Potential impacts to uh, military airspace and a, a military training facility. Uh, potential impacts to irrigated agricultural land that was was high value and, and, and difficult to replace. Uh, visual impacts on uh, scenic trails. Uh, basically, in, anywhere you could put a line, it's going to to impact something, so the 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 permitting process you have to uh, to to do a full uh, an analysis of, of of those impacts. Well, so I, I guess my yes, I I, I kind of knew all that, but I guess my question is, are they not doing all of those explorations of various conflicts simultaneously, or are they waiting until they've checked the box on endangered species, and then they begin the box on Native American, uh, um, you know, sensitive areas, and then they check that box, and then they go, or do they do it all simultaneously? Um, I, I, th I think it can vary from project to project, but I think a lot of it can be somewhat simultaneous, but you may uncover something during the the permitting and have to consider different routing alternatives. And then when a, a new alternative is added, sometimes a, an impact on a different resource is identified on on that alternative. And and I, I know with, with B2H there were even though the the endpoints didn't move a whole lot, the the route there were a lot of route alternatives and adjustments in, in between that were refined as the as the project made its way through the process. So I, I, I still have um, the actual follow up, which was, is there anything that can be done at the state level to speed that up? Could could the could something be passed that causes them to move faster? At the state level, at least. Um, the, maybe that's Michelle. Maybe that's something we could follow up on. Okay. Can, can you repeat that question so I can write it down and find the best subject matter expert to get back to you? Sure. The question. <clears throat> The question basically is, is there anything we can do at the state level to speed up the permitting process for these major transmission lines? Um, okay. Yep. And I might, yeah, I'm not sure if have, uh, Yeah, we have constituent account executives that, that work closely with the, the state government. So we, could, we probably should talk about them. Yeah, that's what I was going to. I, I was going to start with, but we'll. Um, Mark, if you want to email Robert and Mike, 
and just remind them of the questions and then that way they can send me your email so we can get back to you. That would be great. Okay, I don't have their email addresses. Oh, yeah, Mark and I then... thought it was on the Zoom invite. Oh, okay. All right. I was just could I interject something? I was Mark in that same vein. One thing you failed to mention is the uh, difficulty in dealing with individual property owners and acquiring easements from them. Uh, that that is uh, from what I've been told is one of the bigger sticking points. And uh, what how how does that stack up as far as you're concerned, Anders? Yeah, I I think it's uh, with. With a long line in the West, it's often a combination of public and private land that mm -hmm. you'll need to cross. And the, the right of way might be you know, 150 to 250 feet wide mm -hmm. for a, a new high voltage line. And then there's also going to be uh, additional land required for access roads to, you know, to so that the crews can get to the line for construction and maintenance and and so yeah no there generally aren't a lot of landowners clamoring to host this type of, of facility on their land is there anything being done to expedite the acquisition of land for um like the use of eminent domain companies are reluctant to ever use that and i work for pg and they never used eminent domain but uh, they also didn't get some lines built that they wanted to um is that uh, is there anything being done to expedite the acquisition of the easements um you know i i think uh uh, yeah, for for eminent domain. That's another one for. That's probably one we yeah, should follow. Yeah, I think that's an. Yeah, that's another one that kind of it's kind of a. Um, I think a lot of the questions that people are posing are, um, ones that might not really fall in the BPA's, um, you know, purview. It could be other people that you'd have to connect with, but I was going to copy the questions in the chat, mm. and then, hopefully. You know, find people through their email. Um, or if you have put a question in the chat, can you add your email too? So that would be the best way to get back to you. I, I, I could just emphasize yeah. though, that, that that project Dimitri mentioned where we have an existing right away where there's a lower capacity circuit and we're we're looking for the opportunities where we could fit a high capacity circuit. And, in, in where there's constrained corridors. And, and, and that, that's not just, Yeah. And then if we have, we have about 12 more minutes. And so the questions that don't really, you know, kind of fall in your area of expertise, I can get back to people on. Um, but I can just say from a public involvement standpoint for transmission projects I've worked on, it's all of the above that they've stated, and then sometimes there's just things you can't anticipate, you know, like a weather incident or something, or other things, or you know, just you never know. So, I just wanted to share that <laughs> too. And I think that we, does anybody else? So, Pat's had his hand up. Mark, did we finish your questions or? No, well, I did have one more question, but I, I, I want you to be able to go to Pat. I also am not finding anybody's email address anywhere. So should I just put mine in the... Oh, well, if you just put your... Yeah, just put yours. If you're comfortable, you can just put yours in the chat or send it directly to me. And I'm just going to cut and paste the questions from the chat. So um, like, it looks like Jane and Alex, if we don't get to your question with our subject matter experts that are here today, if you want to put your emails in the chat as well, then I can get back to you and find somebody um, in an organization who can respond to that. I just want Mark, to make sure uh, that we get uh, everybody's questions answered. If, if I might just uh, interject here, my email address is Mike Unger at Comcast. You, I have. Okay, and and while while I'm have the floor here, anyone who wants a professional development hour. 
credit to also send a notice to me. Uh, excuse me, go, go for it. Uh, is, is it my turn to ask a question then? Go for it, Pat. I think it's probably for Dimitri because it's more of a modeling question. As you were projecting the winter peak loads, a lot of that, as I understand it, is driven by electric resistance heating. So in addition to increased demand for converting natural gas, electrifying building, converting natural gas furnaces and heat pumps or in, and water heaters to heat pump uh, devices and gaining that, you know, there's also the opportunity to replace el the electric resistance heating which is going to create a, a significant savings that's going to offset a lot of that, you know, peak load demand increase. Did, did you guys factor that into your into your modeling forecast? Yeah, I com uh, completely agree with what you said. You know, there's great potential uh, in the energy efficiency to replace resistive heating with the heat pumps. You know, and that um, some of the studies done by Airpre suggest it can offset largely offset you know the uh, the electrification impact on, on the region so certainly we we i mean we welcome that but for our purpose you know we as anders was shown earlier you know we're trying to study various scenarios right so so be prepared for whatever whatever comes but uh, that, that's a great potential great point thank you Um, you mentioned uh, in your presentation uh, the various organizations that are involved in planning and coordinating um, for uh, adequacy and both generation and, and transmission. Um, is Would a system ISO, be, it seems like a kind of a fragmented system, and uh, would, it, would it be more coherent if it, you did have a system operator ISO and ISO? Would that make things more streamlined and, and more efficient, or is this the best we can do? Um, on, on that, there are some initiatives underway right now where the, the, the near-term step would, would probably be the establishment of, of uh, additional day-ahead markets. And uh, there's a there's one effort that's that's sponsored by uh, California ISO, and then there's a, another effort that, that's led by Southwest Power Pool, and 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 that would it, I guess I'd say generically having a, a a day ahead market that would be be voluntary to join would allow for additional potential efficiencies in the in the dispatch of, of the generation. And then the, you know, the, the full ISO is, that's, a, there's probably a, you know, kind of a complex set of, of, of trade-offs with that. And, and we could maybe follow up with some, some more information on that if you're interested as well. And maybe others to add, you know, Northern Grid is a, is a regional planning organization in the Northwest and includes all the Utilities and, and regulators and stakeholders, you know, so it's pretty, pretty inclusive, um, and they 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 working hard, you know, to ensure the um, uh, reliability of the system. I mean, we have a couple studies, you know, currently in progress. Uh, they're looking at the uh, ten-year uh, plant, looking for the extreme uh, weather conditions and how the region can can deal with their fires and and heat waves and cold snaps. Uh, they also have a project looking at the 20-year planning horizon and just starting. And I think you know the uh, the kickoff um, uh, webinar is in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they also have an offshore wind study uh, working with them jointly together, and as well as the energy storage study. So I mean they they really kind of emerging as a regional planning organization to coordinate all these multiple efforts. Yes. Um. Adam, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. you yet. Yeah. Uh, so it seems that the, 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 you know, that you have your, your winter peak, your double, double peak in winter um, kind of drives how plant, how your load planning goes. Is there anything in your model that talks about 
how uh, customers and themselves could respond to changes in how their pricing structure is. You know, the, the you know, if you use a kilowatt hour at, during the peak, it costs more, you know, you know, yeah, integrating storage in, you know, not just the grid system, but in, you know, people's homes so they can, mm-hmm. you know, be more reactive to the, you know, the price of power at different times during the day and at peaks and not that kind of stuff. Is, that, is there anything in your model um, that's trying to take any of that into account? Well, currently the uh, the four in, I'll speak about the uh, reliability studies, power flow studies, you know, that uh, uh, that I'm involved in, then maybe Andrews can talk about more about economic studies. But in power flow studies, we use forecast, load forecasts provided by the utilities. And um, so, uh, and typically those numbers kind of net up energy efficiency. So they, it's already factored in. But this change in behavior, um, I don't think we have that sophistication to model this, particularly in the predictive manner that, that you describe in like, like you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years down the road, um, at least on the power flow side, I think, um, but on the economic side, I don't know, Andrews, you wanna uh, elaborate what, what you do on the economic side? Yeah, we also use the the loads submitted by our or by our load forecasting group, and then by the other utilities. Um, I I think there we have we have done some projects, especially with uh, larger industrial loads. We did a pilot project where there was a, a steel mill where uh, they agreed to to turn off for or, or to drop their consumption for several hours during a, a limited number of, of events per year where where a transmission path was was constrained and I, I think the with the the energy efficiency and in, in some um, we, we do have a a, a a big energy efficiency program and I think we also have a demand response program and, and we could maybe follow up with with the with those groups to, to get more information but I, I, I think I it, just wanted to do uh, with... basically, basically that gets filtered into the the load forecast that 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 Dimitri and I see in our model um, Anders this is Michelle and I know you have to leave at one it's about 1258. And I was, I think maybe the easiest thing, since we have such an engaged crowd and we have a lot of questions and we're almost at time, I put my email in the chat. So why don't we make it easy and everybody, if you have questions or if you want a copy of the slides, just email me and I will find the best people to reply to the question and send you the slide deck. I believe that Mike or Robert was also going to upload the slide deck to the ESFS website too. Um, but yeah, does that work for everybody? Do you think that's like the easiest way to get all the information everybody needs? Yeah, we, we could we could send the uh, PowerPoint out to to everyone if that that would be okay with BPA. We're glad to do it. It's a great great presentation. Yeah, I think. Okay, um, so you send that out to everybody on the list. Michelle, looking at the at the chat, and I think uh, Jane had a question about the the wind. Um, um, so in in this, uh, I think it was probably related to this slide. I think in this slide, the the wind is a BPA wind in the BPA balancing authority. So it's not owned by BPA. It's 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 what was in 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 our footprint, and it it's all independent power producers, um, and uh, they either sell to the Portland Puget or or to California, um, but you know, that's largely representative of, of seven gigawatt of uh, wind we have in the in the Pacific Northwest, because um, our footprint is so diverse uh, with respect to wind. Oh, okay. I can answer one of the questions real quick on the one well, about the I, Western. Can I, since we're limited on, in time, can I ask my question that I want other people to be able to hear? Please, yeah. Is that a yes? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. 
I've been become aware of the fact that in some of the rural areas that neither electricity nor natural gas is either available or is too expensive and they are using propane and wood for heating and you know there's also more recent acknowledgement that indoor pollution can be as harmful as outdoor pollution and i'm wondering if that's being factored in because i know bpa covers a lot of the rural areas right Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's uh, probably, um, again, BP is a whole, wholesale um, uh, power provider, right? So th that's probably more question to the BPA customers who serve in those communities, um, whether it's a local uh, co-op, you know, or the... Um, yeah, we, we sell the power to the local utilities and they're the ones that engage directly with the residential customers. So Kathy, you might wanna contact the local utility provider to ask them the question because we wouldn't really have much knowledge about you know, how they're engaging with their residents and customers well, on this, that. Well, this, this is a general question that's come up, not a specific. I, I, I made some comments and got people jumping on me. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I haven't heard anybody bring that up before, um, but you might want to start with your local utility just to see if, and if not, then you can always call other utilities, you know, to see just if you're trying to get a general answer too, who's taking that into consideration. And I think, Mark, did you have another question? Your hand's still up. And I, I, I did, but I uh, just, emailed and because we're out of time so that's all right I think um Anders has a meeting at one but Mike and Robert said we could hang on a little longer if we had questions for Dimitri and I for Dimitri do you have a one o'clock too or are you yeah but I can do a few more minutes I, I can't stay longer here you know that's fine Okay, so Dimitri is here for a few more minutes if people have questions, and I guess we can wave goodbye to Anders. So uh, thanks. Can... Yeah, thanks, Anders. Anders. Yeah, thank you, Anders. Really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I guess if, if we have another minute, I, I the, the, the other question I had in the slide talking about the Western Power Tool, it talks about maximum benefit, that it provides maximum benefit. How is that measured? Is that an economic measure? Is that a climate impact measure? Or what, what are we calling maximum benefit? Yeah, I think given today, uh, I mean, I would speculate, you know, uh, for Anders, you know, that, that's probably economic benefit, trying to minimize, you know, the cost of um, operations, you know, and, uh, um, for the, for the customers, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I got another question. Uh, it seems that, you know, it, in general, are you optimistic that we're gonna be able to, you know, get enough <laughs> transmission put in the ground over the, you know, the timelines that we laid out into 2040 to actually meet our demands? I mean, I know you can't say whether it's gonna be yes or no, but like, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, I can, I can tell you what we, we've done. We've done some decarbonization studies, right? In the, uh, for the BPA territory, if I can find the slide, um, I can speak from this one. Um, and it, it seems like, you know, 2030 objectives, which is basically 80% decarbonization, um, a fairly achievable with a reasonable upgrades of the existing transmission. Uh, going beyond that, to get to 100%, I mean, it, it, it will largely depend on the location of the new resources. And um, I think that's, that's the area where we need to think not just transmission planning, but overall uh, system planning. 
uh, we're trying to connect you know, loads and resources with transmission. So we need to have a better clarity of what the new resources are and, and what they look like. And uh, what the role storage plays, you know, whether it's a storage located close to load centers or, or co-located with the renewable plants and whether the, the store energy created on site, you know, with the, by, by electrolyzing plants in you know, a right at the, uh, at the, at the side, or you have a, another pipeline network, you know, that, that, that moves, you know, the say hydrogen or whatever the medium is, you know, to, uh, to the storage locations, you know, so um, it, it's not really 100% clear what 2040 will look like, you know, but that, that's why, you know, what Anders was saying, we're trying to look at multiple scenarios and um, and get uh, get prepared for those. But 2030, we have a pretty reasonable certainty. Uh, well, uh, um, I'll say optimism, you know, that we can meet that, that objective. Thank you. We will we'll, uh, send out the uh, the PowerPoint to uh, to everyone, and uh, want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been extremely interesting, certainly on a personal level. It answered a lot of questions that I had, and uh, uh, yeah, and electric utility industry has a big job ahead of it. That's <laughs> for sure. Thanks. Great meeting. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thanks to everybody who emailed me their questions. And just once again, if you do have a question we didn't get to, you can email me. My email is in the chat. And then the slides will be sent to everybody from Mike and Robert. So thank yeah. you for your patience. We have about 4,000 employees, so I will get you answers. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And Thank you, Dimitri. Really appreciated the presentation and your willingness to come and speak to us today. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It was yeah. Good. Yeah, Mike, can I ask, can you stay on? And I, I want to ask a question about the tour. You bet. Yeah.